Okay. And, uh, but the, the end product of what we do as archaeologists should be to enrich people's lives through publication of archaeological data and interpretation of that data. And so the, the end game of what we do in the field is publications. This, this publication about, I suppose, 75% of it was generated digitally. And this will be in the department of people that are here to look at any time you wish. But all the graphics are generated directly out of GIS. And then we use an extensive traditional things like pencil drawings, watercolours, and digital scans. So uh, this object, for instance, was just put on a scanner and scanned. Now, that may seem facile, but it's not, because our objective is to try and see if we can excavate and record efficiently and produce publications efficiently. In terms of excavation, you know, the, the, an archaeological site is a com complex three-dimensional or four-dimensional matrix of materials which have variability in terms of uh, temporal range, rapidity of formation and rapidity of deformation. And what we're trying to do in terms of digital processing of archaeological data is to identify ways in which we can facilitate ourselves to have better ideas and to test those ideas. Um, in, it's my belief that GIS itself is not really that much used for archaeology. GIS technology is useful for archaeology, but AGIS is not necessarily useful. It only becomes useful when you, the user, start to interact with your data. And the function of the GIS technology is to give you a management sphere within, to ma within which we manage our data. So I consider what I do as an archaeologist as geographic data management rather than geographic information systems. I teach GIS in Durham University, but um, really what we're concerned with is integration of all of our data sources and management of that data with a view to having more fun. Excavation is the best thing you can do with your clothes on. Post-excavation for some people is so bad they never finish. There have been many unpublished excavations that would have been great fun to work on, but the, the publication has never been produced because people get bored with it. And once they're bored for long enough, the, new, the, big, the big issue arrives that they become frightened by it. And archaeologists tend to be frightened by their own data or lack of it. So if you leave an excavation for a very long time, you don't want to publish it really because the excavation was crap. But we accept that a lot of the work that we do in the field is compromised already at birth. It rains, it snows, the director is a bastard. Everything has to happen too quickly. These are the fundamentals of working in the field. And we have to accept that that is also reflected in our records. So we need to adopt, I suppose, a degree of honesty with a view to our own data. And with a view to that, we are about, in the next year, we will publish the entire archives of 15 years worth of, 20, 25 years worth of excavation, which amounts to 32 hectares of open area excavation. Well, I'm a landscape archaeologist. I do not believe that any particular period in the past is any more interesting than any other, except that you get to a certain point, which is quite a long time ago, when you get to the post-interesting period. But everything before then is just as fascinating. I'm concerned in terms of looking at landscapes with the integration of multispectral data, air photographic data, 3D models, excavations, maps, and putting the whole thing together in one pile. I'm not going to talk about all this other stuff today. I'm going to concentrate simply on aspects of the excavation process. I think what you call a US 
we call a context. And so, you know, there are primary data sets that we generate in the field. How we generate those, I will come on to in a minute. But this is what we targeted as being the thing we had to incorporate in such a way that it required no technical skill to use the information. Because as soon as technical skill becomes involved, you get like me, a little bit old and you forget how to do it, um, or people are just too frightened to utilize the information and you want to make your information go out and grab the viewer. And as I said, I'm used to digging very large holes. This is a tiny bit of one excavation. This is uh, 600 meters away, another bit of the same excavation. And this is a little excavation I was involved in in Beirut, where we had 10 meters of stratigraphy and a trench that's uh, 290 meters from here to here and 110 meters wide. So the techniques I'm talking about can be used in urban archaeology, rural archaeology, it's all the same. I don't really care what you do. So I want to look very briefly at uh, the process of collecting data, because this is where I started in my archaeological career in computing. Because uh, we used to fill in these stupid bits of paper. And you'd go into the field with great sheaves of paper and you'd fill in all the boxes and then you'd put them in a cupboard and after the excavation you'd go to the cupboard and you'd take out a piece of paper and you'd look at it and you'd find, oh that's very interesting, where's all the information? They forgot to write it down. Or worse than that, in my case, because I'm incredibly organised, is I would go to the cupboard and take out 20 bits of paper because I was interested in those bits of paper at the time and then I would put them down somewhere. And then a few hours later I'd take out some different bits of paper and I'd put them down somewhere else. And eventually I had paper all over the house and it was impossible to find anything in it. So I thought, I'll have to get a computer. And this is a very obscure thing because I, I knew that computers were truly evil. My father was a mathematician. Um, he spent a lot of time talking about these awful machines and I knew that they would never be relevant in my life. But we investigated in 1983, 4 and 5 the use of handheld data collectors in the field. And in the last few months we've gone back to that and my preferred method of data collection is now one of these. They cost £100, which is liras with loads of zeros at the end, and this thing at the moment has got 12,000 records in it. It has all the records from this cemetery excavation in it. You can use a pen to write on it using a funny little script, a cheap little database, and we can have 20 people using these at the same time, feeding their information into one database. A little bag to put it in that it works in cost £12, which is, in England, that's two and a half packets of cigarettes. <laughs> so, uh, in Italy, that's 20 cases of cigarettes, but, you know, it's similar to petrol. But, but um, you know, they are cheap. Um, I did see one being dropped yesterday and it still worked. Um, you know, it means that in the field, the data is, is literally in your hand, which is far better than bits of paper. And I've been forced to look quite carefully at the way we as archaeologists handle our data. I've been to about 55 million lectures in which people have said, I've got AutoCAD, well, I've got a total station, and you know, I've got this thing called a database. Well, I know everybody has those things. They're jolly useful, but they're bugger all use if you don't integrate them together. You know, we need data sets that are seamless and transparent, where the joins are effectively invisible. Because when we're working in the field, and you're sitting there troweling, or telling people to travel faster, which is what I usually do, um, you're interacting with so many different things, most of which you do not perceive. In London, they developed a method of excavation, which I believe is not particularly good. But it was designed to rapidly extract urban archaeological deposits. One of the characteristics of urban archaeology 
is it lacks subtlety. In the countryside, that's all you've got. You get subtlety and that's everything. So we need to be able to address those issues in our data in the same way as we do when we're playing in the mud. And I found that I looked at the way archaeologists worked in Britain and in America, which is a very pointless exercise in fact, uh, but also in France and in Holland. And there was one school of archaeologists that were doing excavation, and while the excavation was being conducted, these people that were interested in objects would appear, finds, and they would take them away, and they would go and work on them in their finds bit. And then the archaeologists, the excavators, would take off the rest of the paper about the site, and they'd go and work somewhere else. And I thought, this is very odd, because these two things are inextricably tied. They belong together. And in, a, in any data set, one is no use without the other. I know it's very nice to have treasure. It's very nice to have things that are datable. But if you don't have the rest of the archaeological evidence there with them, they're not a lot of use. They're just pretty objects, like these brooches and things. And so I felt it was very important they were integrated. And I ran into a bit of a problem. Because if you use a single context planning method, which um, is advocated in London, there is no real link between the contents of a feature, a rubbish pit or whatever it happens to be, and the pit itself. You can find it by working your way through the record, but in data terms, there was no physical link between the two. And in reality, if your objects that provide your dating and your interpretation of function do not directly relate to the physical deposits, there's not very much you can do. And so that was something we had to address. Another thing that required addressing, and I see that I'm not on the wrong track. For once, I'm possibly working on the right thing, because people have mentioned it several times today. And since my Italian extends as far as Barolo, possibly Grappa, um, but there was this word matrix, which continued to occur. We need a way in which we can reflect temporal change and sequence. And these are ultimately our, the cornerstones of the way we work. And unfortunately, when you see a matrix drawn on paper, it's a static pile of numbers. It doesn't properly express continuity and change. So we needed to try and identify a way in which we could dynamically reflect the stratigraphic matrix across the site. I deliberately don't call it a Harris matrix because I worked with Harris when he took over the Winchester seriation diagram, which is where it all started a very long time ago. Um, and also, Edward and I have disagreements about the way that it might be presented and maintained. We, we looked at lots of different techniques for handling the matrix. Um, some people were using AutoCAD, which provided no advantages at all. Uh, Brian Alvey, um, working in England about 15 years ago, developed a thing called Hindsight, which was an Autolisk program that drove AutoCAD. That was quite interesting and potentially quite useful, but you couldn't change anything. So if you realized that your stratigraphy was wrong, that you had made a mistake, going back into it, then you had to rewrite everything. So it was sort of like a fixed story. But it did provide a way of visualizing the build-up of the site. And once you dig very large holes, you suddenly realize that stratigraphy is no longer just something that's vertical. It's very lateral. And the wall that you have here in the middle of Beirut and another bit that's 60 meters away are the same wall. There is no stratigraphic link between them, but by the time you've dug the site, there is a rubber trench that goes between them. And you can say, right, this is the same wall, but stratigraphically, one's up here and the other one's down there. So you need to be able to change your stratigraphy by not changing the relationships, but by stretching the boundaries and balancing it up. So much of the work that we do in the post-excavation is rearranging our stratigraphic diagram so that it reflects sequence. Because if you have a stratigraphic diagram that is pliable and maneuverable, it can do many more things than simply show sequence. It can control and animate the way you see your site. <coughs> And ultimately, that, I believe, is the sort of thing that we should be moving towards. Now, oh, thanks. The, um, 
We have excavated in what some people consider rather unusual fashion for many years. <coughs> We've three-dimensionally recorded a million objects. Because I thought it was a good idea, and in the end it turned out it was a good idea, aspects of that idea we will not repeat. But unless you try them, you don't find out why they're a waste of time. And it's in certain types of features we would not continue to pursue that activity. But, um, and we've digitally planned in 3D for 20 years. And so I'm fortunate in a way that we've developed a res um, an approach and a technology and a set of resources over a very long time. And we've been able to adapt those according to mad ideas that I might have at three o'clock in the morning. I think it'd be really interesting to, oh my God, now I've got to start again. I wish I had known 20 years ago that programming took a very long time and would actually take up many years of my evenings. Because if I had, I might never have done this work. But in the end, it's, I think it's proved quite useful. Just bear with me while I try and find some data. Now, I, w I got an email saying I wasn't allowed to use any PowerPoint sites. I was only allowed to use real data live. So I will attempt to do that. This data normally resides on a server. And because it took four CDs to get it into this machine, uh, one or two bits of it are missing. But we'll bear with that. This is a, a plan of our most recent excavation. Um, one of the problems we faced is that we, we desired to have digital plans that had the same resolution as our paper plans. And this is a very interesting 1.3 gigabyte DXF file. And you can't load it into a CAD package given the most powerful machine on the planet. So we had to develop our own technology to load the data. It's just too big and uh, too detailed. And a lot of this has been developed over many years. So you know, we interface two other software packages, but essentially everything is managed within here. And uh, I just yeah, it's got all those normal functions you would expect in any normal everyday GIS. You can go in, find a feature, interrogate that feature, and hopefully find it contains something. This one's got lots in it, so it takes a while to get there. So this pulls up from data that's current now that is stored in an access database, the contacts record, your US record, which is up here. And down here are all the finds from that from all the deposits in that feature. Now that's a fundamentally useful thing to be able to do. I probably because I see archaeology as a visual thing, I'm very driven to use visual tools in terms of interacting with my data. Um, so you might want to do that. You might want to visualize the feature itself. In which case you can do that without any trouble. Um, it's a very interesting thing to watch. Sometimes it turns over the other way up. But of course, it doesn't actually tell you very much because it's got nothing in it. It's an empty feature. So, if I pick up some data. Which takes a moment to fire up. This particular feature had, um, I think, 28,000 animal bones in it, um, including lots and lots of tiny fragments. Uh, these are just the large, identifiable, uh, more than two-thirds of a bit of animal. Um, we get some more data. So, 
We've got what, animal bone, you know, objects. This is a Groban house, by the way, a cavity floor building from the um, 5th, 6th century. If we then rotate that, now, there used to be a version of this rotating on our website, and everybody said, why have you got a two and a half megabyte file on your website? So I took it off. But uh, I changed that to two degrees, and we'll just run that now. You can actually see clustering in this material, and you can see people shoveling baskets full of rubbish into this feature. Now, since one of the questions that we, you know, one of our research objectives in this excavation was what the hell are these buildings? What are they for? What is the relationship between the material in them and their use? It was vital that we addressed issues of how can we use the material culture and the environmental evidence to understand these structures. The reality we find from having undertaken a fairly extensive piece of analysis is that these features contain rubbish which has already been somewhere else. So there has been a midden, you know, a great pile of rubbish from which they've extracted material for night soiling. Um, if there's an Italian for that, I don't know what it would be. Um, basically, put your shit on the fields. So, and what's left goes into one of these holes in the ground where there's been a building after the building's gone out of use. So the stuff in these holes is of no use in terms of dating the structure, identifying its function, or anything else. However, the environmental evidence from these has been extremely valuable, and we now know they're made of turf. We know they have supported floors. We know they're made of turf. We know that at least some of them are used for grain storage, which is something they never did in the Dark Ages. They were really kept, you know, they must have used Roman grain or something if you read English reports. Um, so we've, we've resolved a lot of questions. And by having dynamic access to that data, we're able then to go in, play with it. And it doesn't, it doesn't always work, that's another thing. Doing this three-dimensional rotation is not always going to give you an answer. It depends on what questions you ask and what sort of data you have. Um, on a, a Roman site a few years ago, we did a similar thing, but it was a moving section. So you had a metre-wide meter slice through these large ditches, and this would move along the, through the ditch. And we could again see these deposits rising and falling, where they were tipped in, always from one side. Had we not three-dimensionally recorded all the material, we wouldn't have known any of that. We are probably in England a little bit anal about taphonomy and site deformation. Uh, because we have crap sites, we don't have columns. Walls? What are they? You know, we get timber buildings and crappy material culture. And so, you know, we, we had to ask different questions as a result. Now, this is just one structure in an enormous site, and I shall attempt to load the matrix. I'll just uh, stay in here for a bit before I get lost in the, in the big wide world of the matrix. Um, and I just wanted to, because one of the things that we can do on paper very well is we can deal with data at any scale. Our brains are very good at doing scaling. Um, and one of the problems that we needed to resolve straight away was managing data at any resolution. So in this particular case, you can zoom into about two and a half centimeters across the screen. So you can go from that scale to the map of Britain and it, it doesn't effectively uh, change its performance. When you get to the map of Britain, this is only one dot and it only takes a millisecond to draw. So a lot of effort was put into making the software side of it intelligent enough so that you didn't sit there waiting for six weeks for the drawing to appear. I remember going to visit one of the large archaeological units in England. And I was sent by English Heritage as sort of the nasty man to find out how they did their computing. And I, I got there and I had a look around and I rang up the assistant director and I said, you're taking me for lunch. 
I said, no, 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 I'm very busy. I said, no, no, you're taking me for lunch. We must go to the pub immediately. I said, so you've done computers, haven't you? He said, yes, yes, we did those five years ago. I said, well, I think you better buy some new ones because they had staff who were sitting there waiting for 25 minutes, half an hour for AutoCAD to load their drawing because they were running it on a machine that was veritably an antique. It was an archaeological deposit. So, you know, you, you, these things have to be updated all the time, but there are ways in software that you can improve that performance. Now, I could go on for five or six hours, by the way, so I'm going to try and concentrate on a few small things. And since people have been talking about the matrix a lot, we'll look at that, because I know that it's a bit of a nightmare. Because uh, I don't believe, incidentally, that we need software to make up our matrices for us. Because if we can have software that will make up the matrix, can't we get software that will do the excavation and write the book? Then I can sit at home, enjoy the Barolo, and send the software out to do the job. The software cannot do the matrix. It doesn't matter how, yeah, you know, we can write wonderful routines. I have done it once. One of the slowest pieces of software I ever wrote would read all the records and draw this diagram. But because it was drawn by the software, it was meaningless to me. I didn't know what it meant. I couldn't see the things I was interested in in the sequence. And I want people to look at the site when they're digging it. I want them to ask the site questions. Look here, you bastard, tell me what's going on. In the same way as I want them to when they're recording the site, I want them to think about the matrix, think about the stratigraphic sequence. And this is a sequence that can have huge gaps in it. We see all these things stacked on top of each other, but it might be 500 years from this one to this one, and it might be a week from this one to this one. And unless you really interact with it in the field, this doesn't become very clear. And if it's just a load of numbers in boxes that make a pretty thing in the publication to fill a couple of pages, then we might as well not bother to have them at all. You know, ultimately, it's like the pasta that ties the site together. And without it, you know, things like the, the temporal aspect of the way we're working get lost. So this is a matrix with 29,000 contacts in it. I'll find some bit vaguely active. And in order to put it in some piece of software, I had to write the software. There was not any software that could do it. So we had to develop our own toolkit. And I hope to publish something on the web this winter, which you can download, which will allow you to play with it in the same way. Now, because we used to use lines to show the links. Um, and managing the lines when you start moving lumps around is a nightmare. <coughs> we use shading instead. We used to record them in Excel. But for this particular excavation, there, are 12, there were 1,200 Excel sheets which had to be joined together. Um, we worked out it needed more than a kilometre of paper as well. It was really a bit pointless to try and print it or do anything with it. But, um, so in this matrix, we do things a little differently to those that you may have seen. Ah, oh, this is one of these, isn't it? Where's the helicopter pilot? <laughs> um, this thing here is what we call a master number. Now, if you read books about computing in the 1960s, and there are many archaeologists who've done so, you will have hyper-relational databases, and you will not have inverted databases that call themselves. We have minimally related databases, but they are related very specifically, and a database could call records in its own table. So that everything in here, I don't know what this happens to be, but I can find out by clicking on a cell. It's apparently it's an early anglo saxon Gruben house, and it's got these are the deposits in it. So that's the cut. Everything that's in that grouping house is contained in this box. Because it makes it easier for me to read the site, 
because there's 29,000 numbers, to group those things that belong physically together in some way that I can see. The lines of relationship within it are quite, they're just like the lines in a normal matrix, except they're shaded cells. And so you can go up through the trick. These green lines are deposits that are the same. Um, it's an equal deposit. It is the same deposit, it just happens to be on the other side of a bulk. Yeah. Um, and we have a, a symbol for contiguity as well. And then these zoom off to wherever they go in the excavation. Now, if I'm working on this, I may wish to know more about it. So I should be able to go and find that in the plan. And there is that feature. Or I could do the other thing, which is go from the plan to the matrix. So I'll go for this picture here. It takes a while because it's so huge. Um, and it should, oh, it's found it. But it didn't take that long. Um, it must be this thing here. And if I zoom to that, we'll see whether I was right. So, um, so the drawings are directly linked to the matrix. The matrix is directly linked to the both database, which is also linked to the drawings. So we have a full circle. And it doesn't matter which way you attack your data, you can go in it at whichever direction you prefer. Now, analytically, when you're writing the big fat book that says the how they live them days, you need to be able to adjust your data from any direction. Because, particularly if you're working with specialists, you can never believe them. I've recently been told that we have some second century Roman pottery which is very interesting because it always occurs with 4th century Roman pottery. And it's 2nd century because the radiocarbon dates say it's 2nd century. And they got very upset when I said, do it again. And I came back and said, well, there might be a missing error, maybe about 20 years. And I said, do it again. And I'm waiting for the real result. But, you know, one has to be... I need to zoom out a bit. Now, I want to find this one in the matrix. And this one will take a long time to explain down the process. Um, because we can work from the plan to the matrix, the plan to the database, the database to the plan, the matrix to the plan, and in any direction you want, all those things are now tied together in the same way as they are in the field. And I believe this is very important because I think people will start to use matrices if they can actually manage them in this way. The other thing is there's other data than this that. Uh, it's not there yet. <coughs> When it gets there. I'm relying on the fact that as time progresses, um, Microsoft will produce programs that are even bigger, operating systems that are even bigger and go even slower. And everybody else will make even faster computers. In about 25 years' time, the computers will be fast enough to run the Microsoft software so it actually seems like it's going quicker. But it'll actually do things like those searches very fast. So, uh, one of the problems we also have is that having these 27,000 contacts and a million objects is a giant archive. And I got involved in a project in America which was to create a three and a half terabyte database. A terabyte's really big. It's a lot bigger than a giga. It's a thousand gigas or a million gigas or something. But it has a shed load of data. And uh, I had this long meeting with all these people from Oracle and they all sat there in their thousand dollar suits and said, oh, we can do this, no problem. And I thought about this and I said, well, I don't think you're going to. Because I think your software is crap and I don't think it'll work because this has to work on the web. And the people that I was a consultant for started to look very worried when I told the people with Oracle where they could go. And they said, well, you know, and we came out of the speech and they said, you can't do that. We work with these people. And I said, well, not on this project. I said, well, but what are we going to do? And I said, well, we'll do it in access. And I said, but that's, that's impossible. It, it doesn't work. And I said, well, actually it does. Because we haven't got any data in the database. The database is empty. Except that it contains an index to everything, all the data we have. And the data is stored in a database, which is a directory structure. So it's not actually contained in anything other than a directory tree. 
which is indexed to the Access database. So they could spend all the time they were able to spend putting it into Oracle, working out what was actually in their data, and indexing it in the Access database. So they end up with a 190 megabyte Access database, which works on the web and gets you to the three terabytes of knowledge. And as this came about because I was trying to work out how the hell to archive our excavations. Now, amongst the specialists I use, we have 25 different specialists working on the settlement excavation project. I wouldn't say any of them are brain dead, but when it comes to directing them to which button to use to turn the computer on, you have to hold their hand. And so they're not really very computerate. So we had to find a mechanism to distribute our data to them, and this is what we chose to do. So if I go to the matrix, and I double click on a cell, this will take me, hopefully, to an archive record, which is stored in the directory tree as purely HTML. So there's the plan, and there's probably a section drawing with any luck. There's the section drawings, and there's all sorts of boring rubbish that you never really wanted to know about. But it's all there. Everything about every piece of animal bone, all the finds, the context, there's some description in there, there's even a bit of matrix. I don't think this, yeah, this is an old one. The nowadays all the matrices are live. So on the website, you can actually go through the matrix from context to context to context right the way through the site. Um, we then distributed this to them on CD-ROM. And of course, they could all use it. Well, that's really interesting. You've got all this data. I said, yes. We've always had all that data. Um, but you refused to use the database. We sent one outfit, an access database, and said, we can't possibly use this. We've only got a five gigabyte hard disk. And I thought, well, they've obviously got a problem. But, so this is another aspect of the linkage. Now, being held in web pages, that can contain video, photography, um, scanned object drawings, all the stuff that goes into um, the published book and more. And it's very easy to do. And it requires no technology in particular to read it and anybody can access it. We've now been asked to do everything else that we do on the web, which is going to be a nightmare. Um, I foolishly said, oh, that sounds like a good idea, we'll just try it. But, in, in, on one hand, you might say, well, this is all very gimmicky. How does this actually help? Well, I would argue that if we can manage our spatial data in three dimensions, efficiently and fast, the process of doing that becomes not important. It's like picking up a pen to write with. We don't pick up the pen, we pick up the computer, we turn on the computer, and you get on with doing the good stuff, which is you know, deciding how this all works. This particular site, I have to give you a little bit of history, to momentarily. Um, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, uh, the, the Anglo-Saxons arrived on a Wednesday in 410 AD. And because Anglo-Saxon archaeology, early medieval archaeology, is has been controlled by historians in the past. People believe these things. Uh, we have very good evidence now that this site begins at about 380 AD, which means it's 25 years, 30 years before the end of the Roman period. Um, and because we now have that coming back from, I think, 250 C14 dates, and they keep flagging up this very early beginning, I've gone back to the Roman pottery people and said, right, you need to reassess all this pottery now because I think that we've got Anglo-Saxon activity within, the, within a Roman phase of the settlement. And they then use this tool to do all their reanalysis by rewriting a few queries in Access, plotting the whole lot, and they came back and said, oh my goodness, the problems are all disappearing. Which actually had a standing wall over a metre and a half high, which was enormous. Um, there are other data sets, of course, that we do have, and we need to integrate those within our data. And all I have to do is work out where the hell they are on this computer, which could be difficult. 
I borrowed this computer today and, uh, yeah. So, you know, you have things like georeference photographs, very easy to do, drop them in at whatever resolution you can, you know, within this you can have variable resolution photographs. So you can have a photograph with a photograph in it that has a different resolution. One of the problems we had to tackle is that <clears throat> those of you that know about the very old days would have heard of uh, Star Car. I'm involved in excavations of another series of sites near Star Car, which is a Mesolithic site, a peak site, and we use this to map the subsurface map of the site. And we subsurface map the archaeology of London. So you can load up the archaeology of London in 17 layers on top, as solid, 17 solid levels on top of each other and interact with it directly. So like, we want to cut a hole here, is it going to impact this archaeology as far as we know from the model? Now, in that case, we're using GIS technologies, not simply because they're there, but to resolve really quite a complex problem in urban archaeology. We have you know, big cities, we do know, we've got quite a lot of knowledge about the depth of deposits beneath them. But we needed some way which we could interactively manage from an individual trench right the way across the city so that we could perform, I suppose, pre excavation and risk, risk assessment efficiently. In order to do that, we had to address physical solid 3D modeling in a PC. Now, for those of you that do computing, you will know that when you do this at half a metre resolution for the whole of London, this is enormously difficult computationally. But we resolved the way of doing this, which were perfect. And it doesn't store any data around. I, I love storing stuff that doesn't have data. Put the data somewhere else on a shelf. Because most of the time you don't need it, you're looking for the big picture. And if I can utilize this blackboard, my multimedia show this. <laughs> Right. I'm not going to turn it all around. Let's give you a look behind there, just missed a bit. Right, okay. When you, when you do surface modeling, we saw, we saw one of those funny diagrams in the previous lecture. A tin model made of lots of triangles. Well, you, you model the surface, so here's your surface like this. Um, when you go in fully three-dimensional, some bright spark in the past decided, well, you just do it like masses. It's not needed anymore today. When I've finished trashing the room, <laughs> you know, people use rasters to store models in. They're jolly good, because they may look like square things. It's really round on a screen. Well, those things are square, the pixels. And so some bright person said, what you need is voxels. Now, voxels are really crap cars, but a voxel is a cube. So instead of having a pixel, you have a cube. I'm really going off the point here, but the problem with voxels is that they require absolutely enormous quantities of storage. And to do anything with them, you're using vast amounts of memory. So what we did with London and Supercar is uh, we created all our surfaces and instead of voxels we have pipes that go between them. Now that pipe has a grid reference in the X and Y and it has two Zs. And it doesn't exist because it's the bit in between the two surfaces. And because it doesn't exist, we don't have waste space storing it. So we store this surface here, we store this surface here as rasters of TIFF files. We store the knowledge of what goes in here in the little database. I haven't got this on this machine because it's big. Lovely. So our knowledge goes in there. And we know that our knowledge belongs in between these two surfaces. But because we know where it is, we don't need to store any voxels at all. So we just have a pipe that goes between the two. And so what you end up with is a series of models with a series of spaces in between. And we reference the space, and the space could be referenced to a half metre square, 
in this vertical space, and therefore you can store the whole of London at 20 centimetre resolution in a 25 megabyte file. Now, once I able to do that, you can then do interesting things with it. You can say, let's raise the water table, which is one of the things we do with mesolithic sites. Let's flood the subsurface. Let's take water away. Let's reinflate the peat. Because if we're dealing with peat deposit, we need to make you know, we need to wet it so it's not drying out and shrinking. Let's try and recreate the landscape. If you know how much this space in here, which is peat, expands when you add water to it, you can then say, well, I'll make this surface rise to reflect that water. And you can do all the I'm going to be create my building here. I want to see a six cellar there that I'd love to pass. And you can say when they come to you as the archaeologist, you can say that's very nice, that'll be eight million pounds for the excavation. That's something I like to say to people. And usually they say, oh in that case we won't have a car park and we'll try and save the money. But it's it's an approach to the archaeological resource which is designed not just to provide a mechanism for recording it, but a mechanism in which we can use it. Because I get very worried about, you know, we, if we record all this stuff, if we just record it for the hell of it, well, you know, it's, it's slightly illogical. It used to be said we should record things to sufficient standard for things to be reinterpreted in the future. And people have been doing this for a long time, and I, I wholly support the concept of recording things as, who is that? Hold up! Sorry. If you do that, I'm going to start smoking. Now, yeah, we, we, we need to record things with the greatest precision we possibly can. Because if we wish to readdress things, that precision is very important. Well, I don't know what it's like in Italy, but the um, Society of Antiquaries in London uh, did an examination of the people using the library in Oxford, the University Library and the Ashmolean Library, and they, took, they did a complete record of all archaeological books taken out over 15 years. Only books with microfiche in. And the microfiche in Oxford is taken out of the book and put in a file somewhere. And we were told all those years ago, what you need to do is just put it on microfiche. It's great. Anybody can read it, it's no problem. Um, in 15 years, seven times had my microfiche been asked for. I would argue that they might as well just not have bothered. So if one is going to record in detail, which one should, then we have to make it accessible as easily as possible and in as much detail. But that doesn't simply mean chucking data at people. We have a thing in England called the Archaeological Data Service. They store lots of data from excavations. But they're just zip files containing stuff. And of course, if you don't know what's in them, they're of no interest to you. So we need to look very carefully, and I think we need to look carefully in the field at the way we record, so that we generate our own metadata on the fly. Now, those of you that have written up excavations, and I can demonstrate having done such a thing even here, will realize that one of the, there are several things you need to know about writing up, all those students out there. You've got all your data, you've got your GIS, everything's flying, and they want the book tomorrow. It's very easy. You delete chapter 12. Because if you delete chapter 12, nobody knew it was there. Because they haven't read the report yet. So if you just leave out a few bits, you can just forget them. And therefore, you can accelerate your production process. If, on the other hand, it's all in your archives and they are available, you can say, I've run out of time on this book. I was going to write about this but we didn't have the time to do it. So you can go to the archive and maybe somebody else would like to use that archive to write it up. And I don't think that's unrealistic. But they won't do it if they can't get at your data. So this use of HTML in this sort of way um, turns out to be very valuable. Now, if I can find that web CDs The chocolate shop window, it says here. You might not be surprised this laptop belongs to a 
I want to come back to this sort of web CD stuff a little bit because it, it's, it's, the, it's the way that this archive is encapsulated. I could talk hours and hours about <coughs> aspects of the way the field data is processed, but I want to look at just one bit here. Um, this is the way the specialists use it. If they want to see the, the, the snap, that presumably is one there, showing the area under excavation. Um, this thing up here shows you where we are in the excavation, so that's the whole of the site, this is this little area. If I go into this one here, something like that. This is a ditch complex. Um, it's a, an 8th century thing. Um, and it intersects with many other things. So it's got a lot of stratigraphic components. Now, one has to try and find a medium that allows your data to be easily accessible but still alive. You can't teach everybody in the world to use a GIS, especially one you wrote yourself and you haven't had time to write the manual for. But you can teach them how to use a web page. So in this case, this is this feature in all of its glorious, ugly detail, which includes some very, very nasty sections of drawings. Uh, we don't correct any of our drawings. What we have in the field, that's what goes in the archive. We don't redraw anything for publication. So, in this here book, we have some real drawings. And you're welcome to come up and have a butcher's afterwards. Those are field drawings, they're unedited. They're as they came out of the field. All we've done is delete some of the writing. Yeah. The director is an arsehole, it's raining. Those bits get deleted when they go into the book. But we in the archive. But those are straight out of our field drawings. And we use a backlit scanner because it allows us then to do a perfect trace of drawing film uh, and produce very sexy results. The stones are grey and the rest of it. But in this case, this is a piece of the matrix. Now you can see that the matrix develops this hands thing because the matrix itself is live in HTML. <coughs> so we can go around the site from context to context, working our way through these various features. So I'll always go down here to this one, go back to that. And that requires no programming skills at all. Well, the matrix is live. Now that is a sort of a final matrix. And this is after we've messed around with it. Because of course, the matrix is giving us a dynamic that hopefully I've still got back here. When I talked about the matrix being dynamic, I meant that it allowed you to uh, mess with the archaeology as it were. So, reload that matrix. We can animate the site in any direction based on the matrix. So, these colours down this side are designed so that you can say, well, we've got the medieval bits in grey, and there's lots and lots of them, so make them grey. Because the matrix is so large, we have a thing here, which shrinks it down so you can't read it. It's very good having a matrix you can't read, because even though you can't read any of the numbers, you can see how it all fits together. And then you can zoom in and out as you wish. Now, if I wanted to draw the site, I'd go back to here, from, say, this bit of Romano British, through to some of this Middle Saxon stuff. All I do is click on there and say, draw it. And it should start drawing it in sequence. Because I can cut and paste any bit of the matrix anywhere else in the matrix, so I'm moving things up and down all the time. If I decide that I want to rephase the site, all I do is go and rephase the matrix. And we keep an audited version of the matrix through its life, because that means we just keep a lot of 50 megabyte matrices files. They're easy to archive, and they just have dates. And then a little bit of comment that says, we've done this to the matrix and changed it. The active one is now this one. And 
we can go through the site doing this with it. And in fact, we use exactly the same technique to produce all the colour plans in here. And they are nothing to do with the matrix. They are to do with grave goods. Wrong book. But by cut, we, have, we, we keep all the grave statistics, all those exciting things that people would do like brooches read, in an Excel table as well as in a database. And then we can cut and pivot that table into the matrix and say, well, now draw me all the stuff that's got this combination. And it takes two seconds. So to generate all these colour plans, which I'm looking for, I know they're in there, um, it takes very little time at all. Yes, yeah, let's have some period. So there's loads and loads of them. The sort of thing we want to do, you know, gender, age of death, weapon burial, all that sort of stuff. They're just generated by a pivot table and dropping the stuff into the matrix and say, now redraw the plan. Because all we need in that database, or that Excel spreadsheet, is the key ID which links everything together. So all of our records are linked on one thing alone. And it's key ID and it goes into every single record. And it's a site number, an area code, which is two letters, and a unit of stratification, a context number. If it's an object, it's individually they give it two letters. So an object code is slightly longer. And the object record and the context record also contain a field called from draw. And that's how it knows which drawing to produce when you say, let's have a look at all the features that have copper alloy pins in. Because I was very concerned with publication for quite a few years, we've also had to address a lot of areas that we conventionally don't do in archaeology, and that's to do with fuzziness. When you read most archaeological reports, you get to the end of them if you manage to stay away, thinking, well, that's interesting, so that's what happened. You think, why is it that they really know all this stuff? There's no uncertainty anywhere. When we're actually sitting there arguing it out in our head, we talk about uncertainty all the time. And we need to be able to reflect that in the way that we present our results. So, we have a function in here which allows you to change the density of a layer's colour. And it could be bright, dark, and to draw together, and all three different types of grey. So you can say, right, I think all these things are six century, and they're all in red, but it's all this other stuff which could be six century, and so that's in light grey. And so, Instead of making the site into a series of specific, absolute events, we're able to deal with changes through time. When we, we think that's the way it is, but we've got no evidence to prove it. A lot of my archaeology is based on stuff which I've got no evidence to prove. But you know, I think that's part of the process. The process of excavation is iterative. You do something, you go back to it, you think about it a bit more, and then you go back and say, well, actually, I think I've got that wrong. And this is where Andrew Harris and I disagree violently. He says, once you've written your number on the matrix, it can never change. It can't possibly be wrong. I said, I did ask him whether he'd done since 1972, and he claimed to have done so. But I think you can often be wrong. And you can very often be wrong in the matrix. Because we're making fixed decisions about unknown depths of time to put our sequence together. And um, it only takes one change in some subtlety of the site and you suddenly realise, well, this bit of the matrix is actually wrong because that thing is not really on top of that. Something's fallen over and here's the issue. And um, so I, the ultimate test for most archaeologists is driven to excavating a stream channel and recording it stratigraphically. Because you get an awful lot of stratigraphy that's upside down. Because as the river runs and erodes the bank, the bank falls in, and you get pieces of stratigraphy that are reversed. And uh, we had one of those running through the site. I used to use it to, uh, I suppose rather wickedly, to test those people that believe that single context planning was everything. He said, well, go and dig that bit of the street there and record it. And they put on half that a week and said, no problem. It doesn't seem to work. And it's simply that they had conceptualised bits of stratigraphy being upside down, but they quite often 
can be that way. It can be an urban site where you've got ditches, you can be a building falls over into a street, you can have lots of buildings which are inverted, you can have huge deposits which are inverted. So and there are lots of areas where we are fuzzy in the field, but because we've got to fill those boxes in, we make the decision. And that decision is not necessarily well supported. So we need to look at flexible ways of doing that. So the matrix can be a powerful weapon in this reprocessing of data. Uh, if I wanted to pick something up and move it from the Roman to the Middle Saxon, I can do that just by cutting it and pasting it and dragging it around. You can set this to operate in a number of different modes. You can draw the site from top to bottom. Um, a very famous English archaeologist recently said the book to be printed, and she had written the excavation up from the top to the bottom, which is not traditionally the way we do it in England. And she was very upset when it was, she was, it was suggested she could be given assistance to reorder her report. But, <coughs> so you can go from top to bottom, bottom to top, uh, you can animate it so it raises each layer as it goes, and you can save those as uh, GIFs automatically. So you can make an animated GIF, which is your whole excavation sequence. Um, and then you can do various things where you can step up and down using the mouse. Because when you're well, using the keyboard or the mouse, because when you're actually working on a particular piece of bibliography, you might want to say, right, well, I'm not sure about this, and you need to go up and down both times, pick up things above and below to actually sort that out. And you can force a false Z elevation. Because we have real Z values in this data set, um, we can replace those with a value from the matrix, and it just makes up the Z values as it goes through. So that when you look at it isometrically, you have a window through the site. Now, I could talk for many weeks. I was going to do a load of stuff on databases, but we've heard loads about databases today, and they're really not that exciting. They're really good when they're full of stuff. But I think as long as your people are focused on the key component that is making sure that all your bits and pieces join together, whether it be your video, your photograph, your database, your drawing, or your matrix, then you can go forward and do one of the exciting things. I believe the application of computers in my archaeology has improved the quality of the archaeology that I do. It's definitely improved my ability to interpret that archaeology. 22 hectare excavation is a big thing to think about. If I didn't have access to all that data at my fingertips, I think it would take 100 years to not write it up. And I could join many of my colleagues in the, in the book of the damned. Do you know, didn't you take a site at Westminster? Um, that 22 hectare excavation finished on the 17th of December in 1995. We got approval to write it up in 1998. And it will be published next October. All five volumes. There's six volumes, seven volumes. We don't know how many. And I think there'll actually be one volume, and all the rest will be digital. Um, and it will come on CDs in the book, and it will be available live in Internet Archaeology. So the books and the data will be published simultaneously in digital and paper form. So anybody can get it. Um, and then maybe they'll let me do another one. This is actually much more interesting than giving it out for computing it. And I think that's probably enough. Because I probably have more than my 45 minutes. Is that alright? Is there anybody any questions? Or is there anything else you'd like me to elaborate on in more detail? Scanning! The scanning of objects, I just want to show you an object, because I think this is very important, and it's very important when you go shopping. This is, to, this is a shopping problem, because all those brilliant manufacturers who are making scanners have invented a new scanning head that's absolutely crap for archaeology. It's really good for doing paper, but when you buy a scanner next time, please check before you buy it, because you might be buying a turkey.
They make two different types of flat bed scans, basically. And one of them has real depth of field, and one of them doesn't. And the newer scanners, a lot of these very sexy thin scanners, and you think, oh, that looks nice, I'll have one. Isn't it cheap? And you take it home, and you put an object on it, and it scans the bit where the object touches the glass, and you don't see anything else. But uh, these in furs, well, I never. Now, why waste all that bloody time drawing stuff when you can stand? You don't need to draw this junk anymore. Forget about it. Put your drawing people onto doing sexy things like drawing their pottery with a pencil, and doing watercolors of your glass beads, things that actually count. Because this sort of junk can be stand perfectly well. You still have to draw the section which is yet to be done for this. But, um, but you do need to, because somebody bought these books, went out and bought a scanner and said, oh, I've bought a scanner today, but I didn't get a result. And they bought the wrong type of scanner, so you need to check. There are two scanning technologies, one of which is fast and clear, and has a depth of field of about one and a half And uh, that's a mere piece of technical note. Yeah, this is the leaves or something or other from Beirut. But um, yeah, this is a technology that's very easy to use. Um, the time you spend cleaning up the images is relatively limited. And we've used it to archive a small finds from Beirut, and we've used it for all finds from Hesitant. So that we we concentrate our energies on actually thinking about the past and telling a good story rather than anally doing what we do because that's the way we do it. Which I think is the way that people have done archaeology for 20 years. No, we don't do it that way. This is the way we do it. And you say, why? Well, that's the way we do it. We've always done it that way. Well, why not try different ideas? So work. Now I'll shut up now because it's getting very fidgety. I can hear people getting their cold screws out. Must be the time for wine. <laughs>